It took me five years to find a copy of Star Sailor by Tim Buckley in the 1990s. Five years. And when I got it, I was not happy. I did not like that record. That was a five years of like shuffling through boxes. I mean, streaming's incredible. Streaming is all the music in the world in your back pocket. Who wouldn't want that? That's Tom Gray. He's a musician we'll be hearing from later. He's talking about this moment in the mid 2000s that changed music. Suddenly, you could listen to almost any song, any piece of music, whenever you wanted it, on your computer or on your phone. And you didn't have to pirate it through services like Napster or LimeWire. You didn't have to pay per track the way you did on iTunes either. There were all these streaming services. Spotify is obviously a big one that was founded in 2006 and finally launched in the US in 2011. There was also Groove Shark, there was YouTube, there was Pandora. I remember some of those. And the result has been that there's more music available now to the general public, maybe than ever. But a decade on, musicians are struggling to make ends meet. And a global pandemic has made that even harder. So today on the show, we're talking about the music industry, some of the biggest entertainment companies in the world, and a tech giant. We want to talk about how streaming is changing music. Or maybe the question is, can music survive streaming? I'm Alex Perrine. I'm a staff writer at The New Republic. And I'm Laura Marsh, the magazine's literary editor. This is The Politics of Everything. For more political and social commentary by some of the country's most acclaimed independent journalists, subscribe to The New Republic with our New Year, New Administration sale. Get three months of unlimited digital access for just $5. You can take advantage of the deal at tnr.com slash special offer. So today we're talking to Tom Gray. He's a composer, songwriter, and founder of the Broken Record Campaign. Tom, we're talking about music in the age of streaming. Can you just give us a sense of what it's like to be a working musician nowadays and especially over the last year? Well, it's quite hard. There's 50,000 musicians in the UK and the median income is somewhere around £20,000 a year. For our American listeners, that's around $28,000. The truth is, as I've progressed uh, through this industry, I've seen more and more of my fellow musicians coming from more privileged backgrounds Mm -hmm. because it's I think harder and harder to have a sustainable career in the arts without coming from privilege so when everything started closing down it was like oh god the licensing money is going to disappear I could see touring income was obviously going to disappear and with all that merchandise and all the rest of the incomes that come sort of ancillary to touring and we're left with streaming. We're left with recorded music. Streaming now accounts for about 85 or 90% of recorded music sales. And it pays extraordinarily badly. So let's talk about that. What is the general deal? I mean, I'm sure that this varies artist by artist, right? But if you are a musician and your music's on Spotify, all of your albums on Spotify, what are you expecting to get from that? How does streaming actually pay musicians? So you have to understand something called the revenue share model, which is a lot of how all streaming services work, actually. And music is no different. They collect all of the money together from everyone's subscription, right? Pull all the money from advertising, from everything. And then they divide that by the total number of streams in the system. That's the only way you achieve any kind of per stream rate. There is no such thing as a per stream rate. So it's not the same as back in the old days, if you go and buy a single, like the price of that single is say five pounds or five dollars, and everyone who buys it pays the same amount. But in this case, you're competing with every other person who has ever made music to get a share of one pot. Yeah. And of course, what will happen is, 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 as you're aware, you know, some people have like family plans or duo plans, or they have all these other bundle plans, or they're listening on freemium. Mm-hmm. And their streams will have different valuations based on how much money they're putting into the system. So like in a family plan, that's six accounts for like 15 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever. Take the 15 pounds in the UK and divide it by six. That's how much per individual is paying for their total streams. Now, if each of those people is listening to an average amount of music, which is say, 500 and 800 tracks a month their streams are worth an awfully lot less than people who are listening on a premium you understand how it starts to break down so actually if you audit i saw an audit of a pretty big artist recently 
And in one quarter, they were paid 36 different stream rates by one platform. Hmm. I mean, all over the place. You can't say Spotify pays artists X cents per stream or something because it varies so much by who streamed it, how much they stream and how much they are worth to Spotify. Exactly. And when we talk about the stream rates, what we're doing is really sort of smushing all of this data together and kind of dividing it up and looking at averages and trying to kind of work out basically where they are. And when you do that with Spotify, you come out with a horrendously low rate of something like 0.003 dollars per stream, Mm -hmm. which is about a third of what Amazon is paying or whatever. And that's because they have premium services and they have all of this bundling and they have these marketing schemes. They give away Spotify with phones and things like that, you know. So people are listening for free, essentially. So, I mean, 20, 25 years ago, if you were someone who really loved music, how much do you think you were spending per month buying records? This is interesting. I actually looked into this data. It turns out that the amount of money that people spend on music has basically not changed. That surprises me because I would think if you're a music lover and you're buying maybe three or four albums a month, that's like maybe $50, 60 70 compared to like 15 a month for a premium account on Spotify. So we got to remember is the big music listeners and the not really very interested but quite like music on in the background people have been totally cannibalized together by streaming. Mm-hmm. So your big fan only can put 10 bucks into the system and the person who doesn't care anything about you can only put 10 bucks into the system, right? Mm -hmm. So what's what's actually happening is there's more listeners, there's more people paying for music, but when you do the average, it comes out of basically the same because there used to be people who would spend 300 bucks a month on music, but they don't do that anymore because they're streaming. So the average per individual, per consumer, Mm -hmm. has basically not changed. That's interesting. I often think this in the context of how to pay for journalism, which obviously is important to Laura and I. But when people say people aren't willing to pay for the news, I always think, why are people paying an ISP to get on the internet, right? They're paying to get their news, and they're paying to stream their music. And when, you know, 25 years ago, you would have just bought a newspaper, bought a record. There wasn't an intermediary in there that you had to pay for access to those things. You just went to the store and you got those things. I think the worst thing that people, when they really start thinking about streaming, the thing that upsets people most is when they realize that their subscription doesn't go to the music that they listen to. Mm -hmm. It just goes off into this big pot that gets shared out amongst everything else. The average listener, if you are listening to sort of 500 or 800 tracks a month, probably only about two box of your 10 bucks is going to the music that you listen to Mm -hmm. the rest is going to music that you don't listen to (laughs) i don't want to give my money to music that i don't like i don't want to fund music that i hate (laughs) in fact quite the opposite where is the moral right of the consumer in this i mean when you put your 10 bucks in you are funding misogynistic hip-hop you might be funding some of the worst jazz in the world this is where (laughs) your money is going so that for me is a curious problem that that is is a much bigger question for culture more widely i think because if we're saying everyone's just chucking in money to fund the mainstream which is what's happening all the money is going to the most mainstream things Mm -hmm. curiously what we're doing is we're all funding the mainstreamization of of culture we're all going yes please let's all fund the algorithm that makes us all listen to the same 10 songs Well, I'm curious for your thoughts about how streaming has changed tastes. Before streaming, people who didn't want to kind of listen to chart music or really mainstream music could go and seek out their favorite band's records and would often spend a lot of time searching for rare releases and stuff. And that whole culture has really been destroyed by streaming. And in the early days of Spotify, I remember getting it and being like, this is amazing because I can find tracks that... I would have had to travel to a different country (laughs) to buy in a record store in like Nebraska. And now I can access it. So for a while, it kind of seemed like it was opening up taste. We seem to have moved past that into this kind of sludge (laughs) where if you look at the most streamed songs, it's like 10 songs by Ed Sheeran and like Drake. And you don't see a lot of diversity in what kind of breaks through on Spotify. You're absolutely right, look it's wrong to not say that streaming is this incredible technology for music discovery because it is it's unbelievable the problem we've got is that 
streaming solved distribution for the record companies, but it did a total disservice to the artistry of music making. Mm. You've got Daniel Ek telling us now that we all should just be putting out more and more music all the time, like all day long. So Daniel Ek is the CEO of Spotify, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's that guy. And he's <laughs> like, he's, he's like, you should just make more music all the time. That's the only way to feed the algorithm. Kids are like, you have to trick the meta on Instagram or on TikTok <laughs> to get up on top of the algorithm. You have to like do three posts a day and you have to use these hashtags. He's saying that's what we need to do with music. We need to keep making more and more of this crap and just throwing it into the system so that we get we get listened to more. And of course, the problem with music is that if you're making loads of it, it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> so you have been doing some work on this and organizing. What's the backbone of your campaign? Look, we've all been saying to the industry for years we need to sort this out, and the industry hasn't done anything about it. And we complain about it all the time, and they do nothing about it. And so... <sighs> I, I thought, well, I know the only thing that they're afraid of, and it's not me, it's legislation. Obviously, we're based in the US and your work is based in the UK. So there's, yeah. there'll be some differences. But what kind of regulation are you trying to encourage the UK government to adopt? Three things. There's a right, which is actually the performance right called equitable remuneration, which gets paid by radio in the UK and gets paid by satellite radio in the United States. There is a right that's associated with radio performance. And because I think so much of streaming is playlisting now and is this like non-interactive system where it's just, you just press play and it's just playing all day long. Mm -hmm. How is that different from Pandora? If at Spotify call it radio, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It says like Beatles radio. And so I'm like, well, some percentage of this money in the system should be paid directly to performers via this right called equitable remuneration. And that scares the hell out of record companies. Because the big problem in all of this is not the streaming services. I mean, the streaming services are shitty, horrible people, right? <laughs> I mean, they're like Silicon Valley. Who cares? We'll set the word on fire and leave it in burning in our wake. We don't care. We just want to get rich and own a lot of stuff. And that's fine. But the people who are making most of the money from streaming are the major rights holders, which is Sony, Universal and Warner. I think it's nine or 10 billion from the total of 12 billion that came from streaming went to those three companies. And globally, they say they have about 70% of the market, but that's because they don't have China and India and stuff, places like that. It may be as much as 80 or 90% of the market is owned by three companies in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, the contracts that these companies do are called standard record deals. And essentially, this is how it works. They give an artist some money to make a record and to buy them out of their rights. Then the artist pays them back for that money from their small royalty, mm -hmm. their percentage, from their tiny percentage. What you'd hope for, what you'd wish for is a system where they give you some money and then when they've made that money back, they start paying you a royalty. But that's not what happens. You pay them back from your tiny percentage. So most artists never leave debt. Mm. They never leave debt. I mean, we know from Universal's testimony in a recent parliamentary inquiry where they were saying, essentially saying that of their total revenues, only about 20% of it they spend on what they call A&R, which is all of their advance payments, all of their music production, everything. So you could work out that basically only about 5% or lower of Universal, the world's biggest record company, only about 5% is being paid to artists as royalties. So they're taking a big slice of the pie or, in fact, leaving just a very small slice of the pie for other people. How does the equitable remuneration cut them out? If you're being paid as if you're on the radio, do they get less money? Does it go straight to the performer? By precedent in the UK, equitable remuneration is paid 50% to the rights holder, to the record company, and 50% directly to the performers. Mm -hmm irrespective of contract, irrespective of debt, irrespective of anything. So it's just money straight out from stream one to the performer. That's why I want it, because it's just money <laughs> in the pockets of musicians. If I have to take it off Universal, so be it. I mean, that's who it's coming off. The platforms are getting 30%. The record companies are getting about 52 or 55%. Where are the costs now for record companies? What costs have they got? They're not manufacturing anymore. They're not distributing anymore. They haven't got trucks driving CDs all over the country anymore. Mm -hmm. But they're not paying A&R scouts in every city and town to go and stand in bars and listen to music. They just 
looking at TikTok. I mean, what, what, <laughs> what do they do anymore for 95% of the money? They're just marketing companies who are pocketing 95% of the income. I mean, we need to massively reset everything in this because it's a horror show. These companies should have done away with their old contracts from the 20th century. As soon as all of this came along, they haven't. They've done nothing. And so, yeah, I'm sort of swinging a hammer at it using the law. (laughs) And so you said there were three things that you want. That was one of them. What are the other two? Um, I'm trying to get the Competitions and Mergers Authority in the United Kingdom to investigate them all. Record companies as a potentially monopoly? Yeah, as an oligopoly. I mean, Universal is part owned by a Chinese company called Tencent, who part own Spotify, Mm -hmm. and Spotify part own Universal and Tencent. (laughs) I mean, call me old fashioned. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. So there's stuff going on there that isn't great. And then so what's the third thing that you're pushing for? The third thing that I'm asking for is the creation of uh, an actual regulator for the music industry. Essentially, music is being treated as a loss leader across the board by all these companies. Spotify wouldn't care if they were selling carpets or trousers, sorry, pants. Like, they wouldn't care. They would just be like, it'd be the same thing, right? They'd just be selling it cheap and growing their company as fast as they possibly could. Spotify don't care about profit. They have never tried to make profit. They're trying to grow their user base as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to do that, they are loss leading with a product. And that product is music and by loss leading with all of the music that's ever been made (laughs) they are loss leading the entirety of musical culture Mm. it's not good for us so for instance the the example i always use although i don't like comparing music and milk (laughs) it's 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 the one that works best because dairy farmers in the uk have a regulator called the groceries code adjudicator who basically because the big supermarkets use milk as a loss leader so they, they're selling milk very cheap to get people in the door yeah so that people will say oh i need a pint of milk and it's cheap there and then they get their other groceries at the same store exactly okay that was putting dairy farmers out of business so now dairy farmers have an adjudicator who protects the price of milk I'm asking for the same thing, but I'm also asking for a sort of more broad range adjudicator because there's all kinds of really awful, icky things that are still going on in the music business. I mean, young women being horrifically exploited and abused. People basically just calling themselves music managers, like literally just getting off a bus and going, hey, I'm a music manager. Have you met me? And just can just do what they like from there on in. And unfortunately, young kids come along and believe them and find themselves in pretty dark situations and this is the whole problem with music in so many ways is the way that it 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 brings in young people and people of color and just exploits the hell out of them Mm -hmm. and then leaves them for dead Mm -hmm. and i just think that we could do the whole thing a lot better i hope so (laughs) what one would wouldn't one so Tom talked with us about the state of the industry today and how tough it is for musicians. After the break, we're asking how we got here. We revisit the early 2000s when the music industry was facing a crisis and streaming was supposed to save it. Would you like to hear more from TNR? Every day, our writers and editors work to bring you the reporting and analysis you need to make sense of the world. But we can't do it without you. Please consider subscribing to The New Republic with our special offer at tnr.com slash special offer. That's tnr.com slash special offer. So if you think back to the early 2000s, and it's kind of a dim memory, (laughs) this age before streaming, the music industry was already struggling. Like the thing that people were worried about back then was that no one would pay for music at all in the future, that we'd all just be pirating and downloading illegally for free. Here's my memory, because my going off to college, you go off to college and then in our dorm, all the dorms in the dorm were connected on the same network. So everyone was sharing their music libraries. Mm -hmm. And this all, so I was like, I don't ever have to buy a record again. This was in New York. This happened around the same time Tower Records closed in New York. Like it just was like, oh, 
you know, I must have done that. You know, me and my friends at, at the in the NYU dorm must be the people who did that. <laughs> right. Like I remember taking my little box of CDs to college with me the first year. And then the second year I was just like, oh, I can just, uh, I don't need these anymore. I can play music without having this record collection. So you and I, our generation destroyed the industry until these beneficent streaming corporations came in to save it. Is that basically how we understand it happening? That's been the narrative that's formed in my mind over the years. So I can't understand how things went so badly wrong. I think that's why we need to talk to another guest. So we're joined now by David Turner, who writes the newsletter Penny Fractions, which is about the music streaming business. A small disclaimer before we get started. David works for SoundCloud, but he wants to be clear that his views are his alone and don't represent those of his employer. Hi, David. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me today. As a lay person, if you're sort of interested in the music business, you maybe get the sense that the music business is in trouble. You get the sense that artists are not able to make a living through their music anymore and, and that everything has been sort of upended by a technological change. And my question is, is that accepted story of how the music industry fell apart true? And am I, the music consumer, am I responsible because in 1999 I downloaded Napster and, and I started downloading Wilco albums? Did I set this all in motion by doing that in 1999? No, you did not set this in motion doing this in 1999. The record industry overall right now is actually doing really, really well. Profits have been going upwards since around 20, the mid-2010s. And what has been happening is that artists right now have been sort of raising a lot of concerns about this sort of new, this new digital platform and these new digital ways of payment. And for artists to sort of see that hey, these platforms exist and are sort of seemingly making a lot of money off of their work, but they are not sort of seeing that sort of seeing that return come in. So the big issue with the record industry, the same as it's always been, is major labels. It's major labels that sort of had control dating back to like the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, when we used to have at one point six major labels, then we had five and four, and we now only have three. And so when you kind of get looking at that, that sort of becomes, to me, the much bigger issue rather than it being an individual platform or anything or individual consumer choice. I think that's worth highlighting because I, I think people think the music industry is in trouble. But you're saying the industry is doing fine. The industry is making money under current arrangements. It's, it's the artist. When I was growing up listening to music, there was this whole scare around people downloading stuff from Napster and like teens getting prosecuted for like theft of intellectual property. And there was a sense that streaming services were going to save everyone from having to either be criminals or pay like an inordinate amount of money to buy a CD. They were seen as this like great savior, like iTunes was seen as like actually providing a way to monetize music. Spotify was seen as a way of being able to access music and pay for it. What do you make of that narrative? I just find that narrative just on its face laughable. Just sort of imagine the industry, a $10 billion plus industry that could be taken out by a teenager. That's <laughs> hilarious. So what was piracy? How extensive was it? Yeah, so to contextualize piracy a little bit better, internet access wasn't rampant in the late 90s. So somewhere a little over 10%, at least like globally, was the penetration. The internet of the late 90s was not great. You could barely get access to any music. So the idea that it was all of a sudden the introduction of slow downloads was what entirely cratered an industry to me always feels a little bit specious. And then just to be a little bit more serious, there had been a number of academic reports and like academic research into this field. And basically it's kind of a wash as to whether piracy had a real impact on record industry sales. Yeah, it's funny when I, I'm thinking back in my memory, I'm like, I just downloaded so much stuff. But then I like go back to my favorite records that came out in 1998, 1999, 2000. I bought every single one of them. Every single one of them I bought. So I don't even, I don't know what I was spending like, you know, my family's precious like dial-up internet time downloading, like in retrospect. There's sort of an intuitive sense of, hey, I used to buy CDs and music came on digital. I started downloading music and then thus that sort of explains everything. But for most people, they continue to buy CDs. Most people still listen to most music on the radio. There are all these other forms that didn't go away when internet introduced digital downloads. So I want to get into the economics of this in the sense of we hear about these incredibly low rates that get paid out to artists per stream. Mm. How does the music industry currently make money? Where's the money coming from and who's it going to? So the way the music industry makes money right now is mostly through streaming. Streaming accounts for, I think, 80, 85 percent of overall industry, overall like recording industry revenue. And most of that revenue can sort of be attributed back to Spotify and Apple. Spotify 
has a lot of paying subscribers. They have tens of millions, over hundred million, like paying subscribers. And then a lot of it also comes for advertising. Apple also has subscribers. So they, they make a lot of money from that. And then a lot of it is also just sort of subsidized streams. So like Amazon, YouTube, we don't really know if those are like successful businesses within like the Amazon or Alphabet portfolio. We just don't know that really. So the idea is that like 80% of that streaming revenue, it is mostly coming from tech companies. If you sort of notice the trend here of the companies I'm mentioning. And for those companies, Spotify is the only like independent, not owned by a bigger, bigger tech company of those. And it also is the one that's only at two profitable quarters in its over decade of existence. So you can kind of see that this isn't actually a really like sustainable or sort of like profitable business, but it's one that is right now being mostly propped up by in Spotify's case, investors all, all across the globe and sort of finance, advertising, and even the major labels that who previously had investment in, in the company. And then on the Apple, Amazon, Alphabet side, we really don't have a great sense. I assume that Tim Cook just sort of looked at the Apple music costs and just like shrugged his shoulders, like <laughs> whatever, it's fine. And that money's going, as you said, to the major labels primarily then, right? Yes. And so a majority of that money just goes straight into the major label. So this is, again, nothing new. This is how things have basically been since around the 90s, is that major labels account for probably over two thirds of, of that revenue. So that is, in and of itself, isn't that new. And then the rest of that sort of goes to like independent labels, mostly represented in the United States by Merlin, which is sort of a big trade group that represents thousands of smaller independent labels. And then outside of those two buckets, there are like actual independent self-distributed artists or maybe labels outside of Merlin. But those represent um, some like 0.00% of that of that revenue. It's very, very small. A majority of the money is being filtered through the major labels or indie labels right at this point. Musicians have been complaining about their relationships with their labels for a very, very long time. Has streaming made it worse? Has it put musicians in an even worse position with relation to their labels? Or is it the same? I actually think it's fairly analogous. I actually don't really think it's changed all that much. I mean, the deals certainly have changed. I think major label deals have gotten smarter to incorporate more things that artists do. The idea of a 360 deal, so you're taking some part of like touring, merch, and just everything that an artist releases. That's certainly been a newer innovation of the last 20 years. But I think overall, I mean, you can go back to the early 20th century of, of musicians, like blues musicians, complaining about like how record labels treat them. That's not really any different. So a good example is I always think of the of the rapper Silento, who had the song Watch Me from like five years ago. He signed like a five album deal and he never put out an album. And that's like the kind of like deal and kind of like cloud of situation that you would hear from artists certainly 20, 50 years ago, even like a hundred years ago. So a lot of that actually really hasn't changed that much. One interesting wrinkle about streaming, and I will say this is a little bit in a little in the weeds, but it is like kind of a little little odd to think about is that the way that streaming works with like artist payouts even is that it's done sort of on a pro rata model so when drake puts out a new album if he puts out a new album and he's five percent of overall streaming that week he makes five percent of the money like he gets five percent of that overall pie so that means if you put out an album that week that drake did you're going to probably do worse because actually all of the streams and revenue is divided out proportionately. So if you put out a new album on a week where there's a big major release that's sucking up all the oxygen, you're going to actually do worse. And that's like a very small example, but that is actually to me like a very big difference. With streaming, you actually are every week competing against everyone else because the way that things are proportionally split out on that. Let's say it's the 80s and you're a college rock band and you, you sell 10,000 copies of every album that you put out. Yeah. 10,000 people are your fans. They buy your record. You're not penalized for coming out the same week that Thriller comes out. But now you would be. You would make less money if the indie band had a, a release the same week as a giant pop star. And for an indie musician in particular, that is really odd because traditionally an indie musician would not have no reason to care about the mainstream because you're in your own sort of economic sort of bubble where now you do need to be a little concerned that, hey, Taylor Swift put out a new album. That probably I shouldn't put out my new album. I didn't even realize that part of it. To some extent, I, as a guy in his mid-30s, am nostalgic for the way music worked in the culture when I was younger. But like as an economic enterprise, as a business, and as a thing where it's like, well, artists put out albums, people buy albums and singles and play it on the radio. We're talking about a business model that sort of got its start from a technology that's not that old. That was and the, the business model itself is basically just from the 60s. Yeah. Like we just sort of were like, this is how music works. But it was never there was never any reason to think that was permanent. 
Absolutely. No, that is absolutely a great point. There's no reason to think it was permanent. And I think that acting may be one of the things that I think to go back to that point about Napster and sort of like all that stuff is that I think piracy represented such a radical break from that previous paradigm that there was a lot of like hysteria and a lot of concern about it. Where to me, if you go back to the 90s, the really big concern was that there was a thing called Universal Music Group that was brought to us by Seagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was the bigger like cultural problem of, of the late 90s in the recording industry was that you had that. Do you think in that way, the focus on Spotify and the focus on streaming as kind of the villain of the music industry right now has benefited all those other actors because they're so much more visible than Universal. You don't hear people talking about the evils of the major labels in the way that you did when Prince was, you know, railing against his record label. Yes, I do think the focus on streaming companies obscures the fact that this was a system mostly set up by the major labels. I, and that is a system that they've been pretty fine with. I, I always think about, th think about it like this on the exec side. If you're a record executive in the 70s, you had to sell records. You really did care how many records Michael Jackson or Bruce Springsteen sold, because if he didn't sell records, that's only how, that's how much you're going to be making money. Versus in the 2020s, if you're a record exec at the high level, you just... You don't do anything. You just know that you have market share. As long as I'm above 25% of market share, which is almost impossible not to have when there are only three labels, you're good. What do you think of artists' efforts to try and change the current system? Is there any hope there? So over the last couple of years, there have been a number of groups that have arisen up to sort of speak for artists in ways I think are really exciting. So like there's the United Musicians and Allied Workers and a couple of others I know throughout the country that have been sort of rising up. I very much support that, but I do not particularly care for the campaigns that are just yelling at Spotify in particular, because I do think it mystifies and sort of confuses the issue. When you just look at Spotify and you don't look at any of the major labels or any of the other folks. And then I think also because of that, folks don't realize just how confusing the industry is. So a small example of this is that if you like go to Spotify, press Spotify radio, and you just listen to something on like a Spotify radio for an artist, like the money that's being generated from that on the publishing side, i.e. like who wrote the actual song, that is regulated by the United States government, by the Copyright Royalty Board. They like decide how much money those artists are going to pay out on that. That isn't negotiated between labels or anything. And that Copyright Royalty Board is a three-member board that actually has a lot of control over a number of different digital streaming payouts. And no one talks about them. And what happens over the last couple of years is that they tried to up how much they were going to charge streaming services and all the streaming services fought it, basically. They were like, we refuse to pay out for this. And what's happened now is been caught in this legal limbo. So I would love if there were more artist outcry over things the U.S. government already has legal say over rather than trying to appeal to sort of like the heart and minds of private interests. Mm -hmm. It's probably more effective to try to actually come up with a political solution than to just try to beg a private company to stop trying to take money for itself. So it's better for artists if streaming services and labels have to negotiate with this huge entity called the U.S. government <laughs> than with this little person <laughs> who is making some music in private contracts. Yeah, if hundreds of thousands of American artists are organized in a fashion to make demands of Spotify, I would love to see that because that would get stuff done very quickly. Hundreds of thousands of artists are not organized against Spotify. Thus, I'm going to suggest that we aim for that, but maybe try to figure out some other solutions along the way until we get to that. The Politics of Everything is co-produced by TalkHouse. Emily Cook is our executive producer. Melissa Kaplan is our audio engineer. If you want to support the show, something you can do is share your favorite episode with a friend. Thanks for listening. <laughs>